Robin, thank you so much for taking some time to talk to me about the 25th anniversary of this film. Sure. It's a pleasure, okay. thank you. How, how is this film being commemorated or honored this year? I'd say this is the moment right here uh, that we are commemorating this film. It's 25 years old now, but it feels so current as I watch it over. Well, and it's really 30 years because you took, we took a long time to do it. And I don't know, I would like to know what prompted you, what, what triggered you to actually do that project? Because you came to me after you'd already done Cancer Alley in Louisiana. So what got you started on thinking and wanting to, to record what was going on in these places? Was it a book? Was it a person? Was it? I remember reading an article in the New York Times about a so-called ordinary citizen who was just so mad that they started fighting in their backyard. And it was um, the story of Hanford Nuclear Reservation where you are located yeah. so close to. Um, and that inspired me and I started um, from there starting to research um, different places in the country where um, people in their own backyards just became organizers and started uh, creating networks and alliances and, and just um, fighting uh, with you know, every piece of energy they could. Um, okay. Yeah, so I think it started with a New York Times article um, once we started, I was handed uh, just, I must've been handed 10 different copies, um, very, you know, worn copies of, of, of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And so I realized that there was a, a momentum, you know, uh, of people around the country who were um, uh, gathering networks to fight what's happening in their own backyard. But I think it started with one little article in New York Times Okay. And then so, I don't remember, but did you, did, I'm sorry, did you fundraise uh, from Seattle through your organization for us? Yeah. To, yeah. We, we went to Nathan Cummings and Joan Shikagawa gave us the money. So it was fairly easy because you already had the first part done. So we had something to show and you had that plan to do all three. So I think that was what was compelling, was going to different places and not just doing one individual, but showing the momentum of, in, of basic, basically ecological or ecology activists or whatever you call them, environmental I, activists. Sorry. <laughs> I love that you started with the quote from Rachel Carson from Silent Spring in 1962. And the end of that quote, what has already silenced the voices of spring in countless towns in America, that was juxtaposed with Native American singing. And then the film goes on to explore three of these countless towns. How did you choose the three towns that you went to? I, um... I um, wanted to represent air, soil, and water, um, and um, looked for um, three places in our country where there was the most, uh, you know, extreme assault on um, uh, on communities um, through toxic air, uh, soil, and water. And after doing a lot of research, I was also looking for places where. Um, you know, local people were making a difference. Um, and so through all the research, um, San Joaquin Valley in California, Hanford Nuclear Reservation in Washington and um, Cancer Alley in Louisiana really rose up. And yet there are so many more places that, that people yeah. can go. But I also was moved watching the film again and seeing that original quote from Rachel Carson um, and the idea of, um, not only um, uh, towns, um, you know, and um, the idea of spring being silenced, birds being silenced, but people being silenced. 
And so the film definitely was focused on the power of voice um, to make a difference. Who named Cancer Alley, Cancer Alley? Do you know the answer to that question? I do not know the answer to that question. Yeah. Do you know, Robin? No, a lot of people just use that phrase. So it must, it's something that's been used for a long time, it sounds like. Well, it's so much cancer. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know where it comes from. I feel like looking that up, but. Uh, I just well, remember one of the men in the film talking about how there was so much cancer and you know women without breasts and children without limbs and just thinking that it was normal and natural and then sort of coming to the realization that it wasn't at all natural right right and then it, it echoed in Hanford with uh the tour of yeah. the houses and all the people with cancer there and then you see it again the third time so yeah definitely a big theme what impact did you hope that the film would have when you started out making it? And what impact do you think it did have? Uh, well, I, um, I'm a media artist. I do experimental documentaries that are dedicated to participatory practice. And I believe that um, rather than um, uh, you know, some kind of top-down uh, media creation with a, a you know, a, a, the voice of God voiceover, um, uh, that if we just gave voice to people in communities, if we could hear from the witnesses who are fighting the toxic devastation um, and trying to keep their families safe, um, uh, and are uh, moved to uh, like a transformative uh, experience in their life uh, where they, you know, as uh, Wilfred Green says, he's gonna fight till he's dead. And then he hopes his children will carry it on. I just believe that's the power of media. Um, and so uh, I uh, thought that that would be a, a really important way to treat um, um, the story of the devastation that we're all facing in um, towns that have been where spring has been silenced. Um, and uh, whether I think that, and a lot of people use this film as an organizing tool um, for sure um, in all three of these communities and um, across the country. Um, and yet when you look 25 years later, it's, uh, it's uh, the same challenge. Yeah. You know, I want to go back to this idea of people as witnesses, as opposed to subjects or interviewees or interview subjects. But I do want to ask you how it feels to reflect on this film when you're watching, or maybe I know that you're participating and fighting the same kind of battle in our own backyard, Branda, with Norlight. I mean, it's just, it's almost eerie in a way to think about how similar the organizing feels. And in some way, well, I'll start there, but I, it made me wonder whether we've learned anything. Um, in some ways, I don't think we're as good at organizing in 2021 as folks were back in the 70s and, and 80s and 90s. And I don't know, there was a moment with union workers where I, where I thought to myself, that same solidarity, it's rare, where it should be I've asked you a lot of questions here. <laughs> I, could go, I could go on, but let me just stop and, and ask, how does it feel to reflect, you know, juxtapose next to Norlight? Right, so Norlight for people who possibly don't know is um, a toxic waste incinerator that's one mile away from the Sanctuary for Independent Media in North Troy. And we just had the North, this is the last film in the North Troy Environmental Justice Film Festival. We um, uh, have showcased local media makers and local community members who are speaking out and dedicating to their lives to, um, you know, fighting this toxic waste incinerator in our local community. And it makes me think about how these stories are across the country and across the world. 
the film we showed last was Arica, which is in Chile, where um, uh, toxic sludge from Sweden was dumped on this little town. And it's, it's a terribly depressing film because the citizens try to get justice taking um, these, this international corporation to court and they lose and then they appeal and they lose again. And so it, it in a way evokes the me being in these organizing meetings in San Joaquin Valley in people's living room where they, 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 they almost didn't care whether um, change happened in their lives or not. It was beyond that. They believed that just speaking out um, uh, was uh, the, the, the most powerful thing they could do. And I think there's still a role for that, um, that it's still critically important. Um, uh, and that, uh, you know, it's like just one drop in the ocean, um, but um, that you can't live without speaking out um, because then otherwise you're part of, uh, you know, the um, nightmare that uh, you just have to spend your whole life um, giving voice. And it's interesting for me to think about um, uh, you know, the 25 years that have gone by since this film was released. And, um, you know, we often don't totally um, uh, have control over the trajectory of our life, or we can't quite map out what we're going to do. But when I look back, I realize that the voices in Witness to the Future have inspired me from the moment I was with them. Um, uh, uh, from the moment they took over, um, uh, you know, the production, um, they were not um, uh, objects of the lens. They were actually active producers who decided how they wanted to represent their struggle in the, and their community. And their voices still inspire me today um, uh, in all the um, work I'm doing collectively with so many people, including you, Corinne, as a Hudson Mohawk Magazine producer, um, uh, you know, the, this uh, uh, very, very hyper-local media, participatory media project that we're doing at the Sanctuary for Independent Media um, is uh, critical for, you know, uh, envisioning a future um, that is beyond, uh, you know, this moment. Um, and it's, it's, I feel like we're at the edges, of the end of, you know, capitalism, and um, it's almost envisioning, envisioning the future possibilities, but it um, uh, gives me inspiration every day, and everyone I work with still uh, making media gives me inspiration every day. That's what keeps me going. I want to talk about the cinematography. I, I loved the cinematography in this film. And Branda, you know I'm a fan of good cinematography. And there was so much footage. I mean, it was it was a fast-paced documentary, which is different from a lot of the documentaries that you see now, which, you know, they take time over landscapes. But what I noticed is there was so much, right? You you used news headlines and people and rallies and door-to-door -door activities and showing workers working and then all of the neighborhoods. And at one point in the film, one of your interview subjects was noting all of the wealth extracted from these areas juxtaposed against, I don't wanna call them run down neighborhoods, but they were definitely neighborhoods that were not seeing that influx of wealth. Mm -hmm. There was so much artistic design there. Can Robin, can, can you speak to that? Well, from the Hanford perspective, my husband was the cinematographer, so <laughs> he wasn't my husband at the time. <laughs> and he you appreciate good cinematography too. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And you know, Brenda kept saying, "Bigger close up, bigger close up. We want them like this," you know. <laughs> and he he accommodated that, and he was um, very sensitive to that point of view that Brenda had of you know, get these people where they live inside their passion. So, you know, I'm, I'm very proud that he was able to kind of deliver that over and over again with so many of the interviews that we had to do. 
I don't remember this part, but what, you know, there's something very passionate about a, a creating a radical media together. So did yeah. that plant the seed for your relationship? Oh, uh, it didn't hurt it. <laughs> <laughs> I know you and I kind of tangled a little bit and I, I grew up a lot working with you and learned a lot from you. It was a, a very challenging but rewarding experience to be able to work with you. I never got to work with artists directly like that. I never got to be kind of the equal. I was always the one writing, you know, the producer, writing the grants, kind of moving the pawns around on the table, but never being the, the part of the creative process like I was with this project. So it gave me a lot of appreciation for how hard that is when egos clash, and, you know, people are having different opinions on the fly as we're, you know, shooting these people that are really crying or they're really passionate and oh my god the emotional level of all that project was pretty high <laughs> you know it um watching it it brought back that emotional level that that in almost every place we shot i mean people were crying yeah were yelling um but i don't remember all the ego clashes so <laughs> <laughs> kind of interested. I remember that we had an incredibly um, reduced schedule wherever we went. We really, yeah. and that you kept us on track. Um, was that, that was my role? <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. How long, so we, how long did it take to, to make the film? Uh, to shoot it, uh, we had like a month. You know, here's the uh, calendar. <laughs> Every day <laughs> we uh, had to be somewhere else. I mean, luckily, Marty had a plane. We could actually fly <laughs> and we had a car that we could drive and we had a, a cell phone that we could use. So we were pretty sophisticated in our production uh, technologies here. We were very lucky. And Marty had a, a, a production company with gear, right. which was yeah. really great. And she donated all of it. So I think he got paid a little, but not much. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell him that. <laughs> Given that time frame, I'm I'm really astounded. I didn't expect you to tell me it was a month because how did you find these people? Surely that had to have taken longer than a month. And how the did phone you, letters? And how, no, but like how it's not just finding people, then it's like. How did you gain their trust? There was such a broad array of people from farm workers, neighbors, activists, yeah. scientists, a, you know, a farm owner. How do you get people to trust you on that short of a time frame? Boy, we just did. We were sincere. <laughs> and we represented independent media. So I think, I mean, you, Branda, you really had to draw out a lot of that trust and draw on it when you did the interviews. There were a lot of, um, as you say, we spent a lot of time on the phone. Yeah. And uh, then when we would gain trust with one witness, they would give us others. Yes. And, uh, and, and also we were really interested in the, you know, local grassroots organizations that they yes. were part of and yes. they would help us. Right. So like yep. Louis, lean Louisiana environmental action network became really valuable. And, um, what were the organizations in Seattle that oh, were? Oh, God, there were the downwinders, there were the whistleblowers, there were the environmental groups in Seattle and in Hanford. I mean, we had to work across a whole state yeah. to really create a network of people. And they had their own network. So networks were meeting networks. And I, I was reading in one of the interviews where um, people that were downwinders were saying, well, why do you have whistleblowers here? And Brandis said, but it's all the same story. And then afterwards they realized it was the same story. They hadn't realized it. So they created their own connections afterwards. That was really helpful too. And it was really important for us to have the indigenous voices be yeah. represented. And that we had to work, you know, we had to really be dedicated to that. And those yep. were our guiding voices. Yeah, yeah. But you know, I do remember that in the beginning when you ask about trust, um, 
you know, as a filmmaker, I mean, you know, we're so conscious as filmmakers about our power um, when we um, point the lens at a subject. I mean, it's something like a gun. It is a weapon and it, um, uh, and uh, the person in front of the camera becomes the object. And that relationship between the filmmaker and the filmed um, is um, something that, you know, we, you know, uh, that I look at uh, critiquing and investigating every day. And, and so, we talked about it. Yeah. We talked about it with the subjects. And I think that's where a lot of the trust came from. They got it. They understood that it was very different than the usual TV interview, you know, where the crew comes in and does five minutes and then they're gone. Right, and they would talk about that, wouldn't they, with us? Because most yeah. of those people had already become spokespersons, right? right. They had never had the kind of re production relationship that they had with us. Right, yeah, it was very different. And they appreciated I that. I have to say that there, I remember this one thing. So, and of course I was coming from um, uh, working in Hollywood in the day as uh, mainly a video editor and um, uh, at night being an independent media artist. Um, and I was working between LA and New York City and Boston and doing a lot of um, participatory media and community media projects. And so I knew kind of my, um, uh, skills, which in some way I think are uh, kind of part of the evil empire of being a fast cutting editor. And, mm -hmm. um, and so in the beginning of Witness the Future, when we started at, um, in um, uh, Cancer Alley, I decided that I wouldn't edit, that I would have this relationship with the subject and that in one shot, I would just give them one shot without editing to speak their mind. And I remember the first, the first interview I did, I was in somebody's home, you know, like with the factory right out the window. And I mean, and, and I think it was the child with asthma. Um, it was like, oh, um, wow. yeah, you know, and um, uh, Mona Jacobs. And I was um, on take 18. Oh my God. She couldn't get it. They couldn't get it in one shot. And I realized, Throw that out the window. <laughs> you know, well, that's like a well formal conceptual. <laughs> it's like absurd. Let them just talk and edit afterwards. And so um, I, I stopped that. And but continuously at the beginning of every day, as Robin says, we would question how can we shift the power to them? Mm -hmm. You know, how can we be there to serve them? Well, the, the power that you wield then is in the editing right? Because preserving, you know, letting people speak, letting them ramble, letting them get to the point is, is somehow, in fact, it's giving them more power. And then you have the responsibility of preserving their voice yeah. at the end and not, you know, not, not editing it for your own means in some yeah. ways, right? Well, we had to do the editing for our own means. Well, I mean, <laughs> summer, what I mean but... by that is, you know, you can edit in, in different ways, right? You can edit to make your subject look good. You can edit to fit your own political ends, or you can edit to respect the voice of your witness. Yes. Right? That's ultimately what you did. Yeah. And I couldn't do some kind of false uh, filmmaking conceit, you know, and do justice to them telling their story. So I, uh, yep. And Robin, I loved what you said about how the whistleblowers said, why do you have the downwinders here? Because it makes me think participatory film, is this what you called it? Participatory filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was a litigator at one point and there's participatory litigation also mm -hmm. and partic participatory research. And yes. you recognize that you're giving up some power to the people that you're participating with. And yeah. it's risky. It's risky, but the rewards are, are great. Yep. And there's another interview that um, I've been reading that I forgot we did, Branda, where we talk about um, it's a feminine, a feminist 
perspective and a feminist approach to media where you're giving a gift, you're passing on the power to the people and you're just serving them, basically. You're just there to help them do their best in doing what they wanna do. And that's what we were practicing every day was that, that gift, gift economy, gift, gifting of what they have to give us back when we record what they've got to say. Yeah. yeah, you know there was there was so much heart in this movie, and I felt like I wanted more. Like every time I thought, well, they can't possibly raise. There's so much already. They can't possibly raise uh, environmental racism, and the, and then there it was, the word <laughs> racism right there. And the and then almost immediately, one of your subjects turned to you know, economic racism. It was almost seamless. It was on the one, racism was the word. And then you were talking about environmental racism and then your subject, I'm sorry, your witness talked about economic racism. And I, and then, and then you went just directly quickly right into the interplay between labor and the environment. And I remember one of your witnesses said, environmental workers are known for taking jobs away but we wanna make yes. workplaces safer. And I thought environmental workers are still known as, yeah. as taking jobs away. It's rare. I mean, you know, I don't work in this field. I observe it, but I think it's rare to see that kind of collaboration between unions and environmentalists. So capturing it as you did in 1996 was just so fascinating for me. Yeah. They were, they were really, they understood the intersect, intersectional power of organizing. Yes. And, um, when you think about today, I mean, I think that's our, that's one thing at the sanctuary that we are, you know, ser like seriously focused on is trying to make those uh, connections, build bridges between these intersectional justice movements, which are so deeply interconnected and yet par running parallel tracks and often never connecting. Environmentalists, you know, not connecting with anti-racist organizers, um, uh, not connecting with labor organizers, um, that we're all in our silos and, um, and um, yeah, it's, it's a WTO moment when you can bring all those together. I mean, that's what happened right after we did this project was the WTO here in Seattle. And yeah. you saw that same coming together. Wow. That was talk 99. That. Yeah, talk about that a little, because maybe some people, younger people, don't even know about the WTO yeah. moment. Well, that's where the environmentalists and the union organizers and the slow food people and you know, all the tree huggers all came together and realized we, we are all in this together and let's do this together. And that was the, the underlying um, process that then brought out all the demonstrators and caused the, the, the big boom in, down, in the streets of Seattle. Why does that feel like a moment to me, um, Robin and Brenda, both of you, instead of a turning point? Because the forces of evil are so much bigger than even that, even that big boom can't, can't get past the money and the power of the governments and the corporations and the, the wealthy people. We're still trying to figure that out. We're not there. Branda, do you have any <laughs> thoughts about that? I feel, you know, as you get older, you become an elder and you look back at the struggles that you've done and you wonder, you know, I mean, how much of your life has been consumed with these struggles. And, and um, it's like waves in the ocean, it seems to me. And so I don't see it as a boom or, you know, as a, a, I, there's a continuity there that we're still part of. We are still part of that movement, part of that history. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we just need to uh, continue the struggle. I mean, it's, it is sometimes one feels despondent, but um, I just don't think there's any alternative. 
other than um, speaking out and uh, you know, creating situations where people have a voice uh, to share their stories. Uh, I think there's a power in that that hopefully, uh, possibly not in my lifetime, um, okay. but uh, you know, will make a transformative change. I hope this doesn't bring up too much sadness, but I, I noticed that the film was dedicated to the memory of Darnell Dunn and Andrew Kopkin. Who were they? Um, Darnell Dunn was one of the labor organizers um, uh, in San Juan, I mean, in, in Cancer Alley. And he was just uh, incredibly inspirational. And also it was very uh, key because he was black and he worked with his partner who was white. And, you know, when, when we shot that film, uh, we had an African-American cameraman. And I remember that it was like, you know, there was a lot of hardship just to the production, you know, just going around the streets, you know, with a mixed race crew um, uh, presented all these challenges. When we were in um, Hanford Nuclear Reservation, the witnesses said to us, you know, you're under surveillance. And my phone was clicking the whole time. We were under surveillance. So um, uh, Darnell Dunn was just this incredibly inspiring a um, uh, strong labor organizer who was really, really important at that time, um, who had just passed away, you know, in the after we had shot, uh, it, as we were doing post production. Um, Andrew Kopkind was the editor of The Nation, a really brilliant, progressive, important journalist and writer who passed away um, uh, at about the age of 50. And it was just very tragic. It was at the same time. And he was an inspiration for this film. So we also dedicated to him. And again, it's about the dedication of people's voices and the power of people's voices. I loved the soundtrack. <laughs> I, I just, I kind of felt like you could, you could market just the soundtrack aside from the film. I mean, the, the brilliance of it, every piece of music was, perfectly paired with what you were dealing with uh, in the film. So you had reggae, you had, um, it's, it sounded like Appalachian music, folk music, um, you know, soul music. New Orleans music, yeah. New Orleans music, you had Native American music. And I did wonder that it's not easy to get Native American folks to agree to have you film them singing. Oh yeah. Or, or even on camera. So yeah. how, how did that happen? That, <laughs> that was a trick. <laughs> Do you remember that Robin? How did yeah. that happen? Well, somehow we got the Wanapums to trust us and they offered to let us listen to Mary, I think her name was. And we just sat there and recorded the whole thing. She was just on her couch, right? And Branda said, we need this, let's do this. So we had no idea what we'd use it for, but there it was, you know, Native American singing. It was brilliant. It was I know. Brilliant. And then- <laughs> we had no idea if we'd use it or not. And then we shall not be moved in Spanish. I mean, it was, and, and that was, it seemed organic. You didn't stage that. You didn't pay for the rights to that. You, it happened during the Well, film. and then the woman singing with a guitar about, uh, I forget, we, a folk song. She, they adopted the folk song. We just happened to be at a meeting or was it the church service where she sang that song? And again, we took the time to record it. And I think it, it's just recognizing the power of music also to really um, uh, you know, uh, plant a seed um, for uh, inspiring a person to, you know, make a change in their community. I think music, media, we're really interested in how to use um, art um, as an organizing tool. Yeah. And um, uh, I wish that the person under in tech support would just respond <laughs> because of uh, the person in tech support, Steve Pierce. Um, uh, who was another relationship that had just begun at that time, actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 
uh, Steve is a musicologist. He just knows the power yeah. of music, especially music resistance music. Yes, and, that was his specialty. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So he was very, very important in advising um, uh, us in the musical choices. Yeah. And also he had been very involved living um, uh, in um, New Orleans. So he knew a lot about the music of, um, you know, Louisiana and New Orleans. Well, you can pass on to our tech support person that it was just brilliant. <laughs> so there, at the end of the film, one of the things that, can I say one of the things that bothered me about the film? Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to know everybody's name and affiliation where they, I wanted to know more. I mean, look, I wanted to know more about so much in the film, but definitely all the people and the things that you used. And you ended with someone very official sounding and it made me wonder like, should I know who this person is? It was someone articulating four principles. That was four a preacher. That was a preacher. <laughs> Four principles of what? I don't know, but they sounded brilliant and applicable to so many situations. And then I thought, who is this guy? And why did you end with him? And where did you find him? So tell me That's more true. about that. That's true. I mean, we look, he, ta he talked about standing in the right place and at the right time doing the right thing. There's footage of us right. with the with the um, church when we when they talk about how the church organized the first downwinders, I think, group, and you see it, the people in the aisles, and that's when we recorded him, and you see him without hearing his voice singing from the pulpit. So he's on camera, but he's not on camera when he when you hear him talking. We, we took his voice. Yeah, he um, uh, the 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 Unitarian that Unitarian Church, yes. um, um, uh, as part of what they felt was their ethical responsibility in the world, um, got the U.S. government to release through yeah. the Freedom of Information Act um, the evidence that the people in that area were you know unknowing um, guinea pigs to yeah. the purposeful release of of radioactive material which actually was measured at downwind in Troy, New York by RPI students. All right. Um, you know, went across the country. It wasn't really just right there. I mean, that's the thing about my backyard. It's, you know, it's all of our backyards. And, you know, he said, you should not uh, set out to change the world without setting out to change yourself. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, the piece, um, you know, it was a creative piece, it was an organizing piece, but it also was a spiritual piece for everyone who was involved in it. It was a spiritual calling to speak out. And I think for me, something I'm still working on is the wisdom of his quote. It actually struck me as I listened to it again, because yeah. it's true, you can't set out to change the world, you know, without setting out to change yourself. And that's every day. I think, yes. uh, you know, questioning your position in the world every day and, um, you know, um, just having the strength to speak out, even when it seems against such great odds. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about the farm owner with the 40 acres that you interviewed and how he said that he was moved to change his own practices when his own son got sick, right? Mm -hmm. There's so much I wanna say about that, but what follows from what you just mentioned, Brenda, is that, you know, he sounded so hopeful, right? He, he said that what I do on my 40 acres will have a ripple effect, implying that it would change everything. He said it would change the next farm over and the town and the city and the next state. And I thought it sounds so hopeful, but we're still fighting the same battle. I mean, I guess we're, we're coming full circle and talking about what we did at the beginning, but it is mm -hmm. frustrating, isn't it? I mean, now we know that that gorgeous looking produce comes at a cost. Now we know how important it is to provide organic food to inner city neighborhoods. We know these things, but we're still fighting some of the same battles. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that these kinds of um, discrimination and economic disparity, 
they go back centuries. So, you know, how can we think we're going to fix it in our lifetime? We've just got to keep talking about it. And I, that's where I'm hopeful is that racism is being addressed in this country at a level I've never seen in my lifetime. And I grew up with racist parents that I've had to personally overcome a lot of that stuff. And so I am hopeful more than I've been that we will heal a little bit more. Brenda, are you hopeful? I um, am hopeful and I, um, I'm hopeful hearing Robin uh, and Robin, what you just said. And um, I agree that the, you know, why, how do we think that in our little meager lives that we can make such change that's been, with, with, that, that's grounded in such systemic racism and um, disrespect of Mother Earth and of uh, uh, and you people. Know, yeah, and of people. And um, it makes me think also of the other film that was featured in the North Troy Environmental Film F um, Justice Film Festival, um, Echoes from Lock One. And, um, you know, this was done with youth in North Central Troy who have grown up uh, right at the history of the beginning of the Erie Canal along the Hudson River, but barely are connected to it. I mean, barely know what's there, who were researching, you know, the legacy. Um, of the Hudson River. And one of their interviews um, uh, was with um, uh, the Stockbridge Muncie community, a representative from the Stockbridge Muncie community, Bonnie Hartley, who taught them about the forced um, removal and relocation of the Stockbridge Muncie community from right where the sanctuary was at the shore of the Hudson, right at the northern tip of the Hudson River estuary. And they were forcibly relocated to um, uh, Wisconsin. And our young youth who, um, uh, who are in the water justice lab, uh, who are uh, young girls of, uh, young teenagers uh, who are uh, of color, who are scientists, they're learning to test the Hudson River. They had this deep conversation um, about um, uh, racism um, and um, um, disrespect for Mother Earth that the indigenous people in this film talked about. And their the racism and colonialism, um, the same kind of racism against people is the same kind of hate against nature. That connection um, is so um, uh, clear. And I think that's, that's really essential. Um, uh, to keep making those connections between the environmental movement and um, uh, you know all the different um, you know uh, work that's being done to fight systemic racism so, because it's one, um, and so I see more intersectional organizing, especially in young our younger generations, and and that uh, does give me hope. You know, there's also the, you know, you take a step forward and then you take several steps back and you just, we seem to be moving along like that. Like I remember being in, in San Joaquin Valley um, um, uh, with the woman who was like organizing for organic food. That was like very unusual. She was like really making a scene in the grocery store demanding organic food. And I never really had thought about the arsenic on my potato before, you know, I mean, it was just shocking to learn. Yeah. And now there's organic food everywhere. And yet still um, it's, you know, about the almighty dollar, right? And there's, you know, plastic uh, around organic food that's shipped from foreign countries. And, um, and we still have food deserts. And we still oh, yeah. have like North yeah. Troy where, where, where we have no supermarkets. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You know, and every once in a while, there's some extraordinary person who stands up alone um, and has a voice that does ripple. And so we just have to believe in that. I think it's almost a, a spiritual commitment to believe in that um, as artists, as organizers, as people, you know, yeah. and to kind of fight uh, to bring together um, our, you know, to fight against the divisions and uh, look for unity, you know, in the community. 
<laughs> Poetic. It's been such a privilege talking to you. I really thank you for, you know, letting me watch this film with you, talk, mm. talk about this film with you. Um, and happy 25th anniversary of the film and the work that you did then. Thank you. I mean, I feel like the work is continuing and anybody who's watching this and what wants to get involved with us at the Sanctuary for Independent Media, there's all kinds of people um, producing media, uh, radio, um, and um, intersecting between media, art, and science um, to let voices be heard. And um, we invite everyone listening to this to join in. Um, it, it's, um, you know, it's challenging, but is, it is uh, powerful and it is fulfilling, you know, and it's a great way to connect with people in the community and have fun as well, you know? That's for sure. It's hard, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it has deep value, you know? Coming together as people trying to make a change, speaking out for what we believe in, not being silenced. And it's real inspiration going back to Rachel Carson who wrote Silent Spring in 1962. And it really shows the power. I mean, she was an artist and she was a scientist. And um, that book she wrote um, is still in people's back pockets today. Yeah. Yeah. Out organizing. 60 years next year, it'll be. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you.